All right, so this is going to be our first lecture for this course. And I promise you I won't keep you till 4 something. I'll let you out by 3.30. We'll go for an hour or so. I never like, you know, it's a bad omen to, to keep the class the full length on the first day of class. Every time I've ever done that, I've always had problems with the class. So it's like a lucky thing. You know, it's like an omen. I, I have to let you out a little early today just because that's how it works. <laughs> All right, so... Um, and because you are after lunch, I do have a tendency to, to speak longer because I have more energy. I've just had lunch. <laughs> so I have tons of energy ready to go. Um, so, you know, versus in the morning when the class, you know, I just want to have lunch. You know, I want to get out early, you know. So unfortunately, you're going to catch the long-winded version of me. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. So I've got two categories, as I mentioned before. One says technology management. The other one says Managing innovations. I'm going to start with the managing innovations because it gives a better overview. It gives a better overview of uh, engineering management. So this one's called uh, lecture number one. And when you download lecture number one, it's the MS. Here it is right here. Looks like this. And it says chapter one on it. And you're wondering, well, what's chapter one? So I have an old book called Managing Innovations. Uh, engineering management, ma the management of innovations. And at the end of here, I used to have in here, and I'm not sure if it's still there. It's on the bottom. We have the IS Today, because there's pieces out of here that are coming from different books. So at the bottom, either on the last page of the lectures or on the bottom of the screen, you'll see the reference to where it's coming from, just in case you want some more information out of here. So as I mentioned before, we don't have a textbook, but you might, you know, necessarily, I mean, you might want to, I don't know, you might want to explore something, and if you do, then you have the options. It's on the, it's printed in the lectures. All right, so let's talk about managing information and managing digital world in terms of engineering management. So what do engineering management managers do? It's a funny job, actually. Uh, most of them come from a, Engineering undergrad, you get an MBA, and you turn into an engineering manager. Or you do the opposite. You're a business student, and you need to get a, a, a master's degree in software engineering, or computer engineering, or electrical engineering, and then you become an engineering manager. Because you need to know both. Because what you're managing is technology, innovation, change, and it's kind of interesting. It's a different type of management. It's not like, for example, accounting, finance, <laughs> um, marketing in general, but marketing does kind of overlap a little bit with engineering management. But you're managing uh, projects, you're managing um, research, you're managing manufacturing, you're managing something related with technology. So it's managing in the digital world for the most part in terms of what it is you're doing. So if you're uh, giving customers, uh, there's another little quote here from Steve Jobs here on the front of this kind of slides here. If we'd given customers what they said they wanted, we'd have to build a computer that they'd ha be, been happy with a year after we spoke to them, not something that they'd, uh, they'd really want now, which is basically, you could probably could do a better job reading that on your own, <laughs> but basically getting at the concept of we have to manage the future and that if we manage today, we're behind times. And, uh, you know, the little picture of this iPhone here is kind of interesting, too, because, you know, before the iPhone came out, somebody had to figure out that people wanted the iPhone, which is what this quote is kind of getting at in general. It's like, how do you know that people want an iPhone? How do you know that people want tablets? How do you know people are going to use tablets? Uh, there's a lot of products out there that failed miserably. The Apple TV is actually kind of one of them. <laughs> I mean, because we're looking at Apple here. Not everything Apple's done has been perfect. Um, a lot of people say that the uh, uh, Mini... Remember the little box that was a computer all-in-one? Still on the market, I think, isn't it? I'm not even sure if it's on the market. It wasn't one of their best sellers. And uh, neither was the Apple TV, but it's still on the market. It's kind of like one of those products you think that might be popular, but it's not popular. So how did they know that the iPod was going to be popular? They didn't know that. Um, but let's talk about Apple as a company, however. Um, they're like one of the best engineering management examples out there because... They really do know how to manage technology and innovation. And if I were to pick a core competency of this company, it's industrial design. And the industrial design is why that looks so nice. It's the look and feel. It's the coloring, the texture, the touch. Does it have anything to do with technology? No, it's cosmetic. In fact, the first version of the iPod that came out was not that technology 
technologically advanced. It was pretty thick, if you remember. It was pretty, uh, wasn't really that sleek. <laughs> now they've improved upon a lot of stuff. In fact, you know, you think about it, it's like, why didn't they come out with the retina screen in the first version? They didn't. So somebody had to plan, when are they going to release these products? How often are you going to release it? And personally, you know, I've always been surprised how fast Apple puts stuff out. And people still buy it. When you think about it, I mean, we just have, what, how many, you know, four, four, five, six release of this iPhone product. I mean, there's really a seven or eight around the corner, who knows. Um, they put out the iPad, and they have the iPad mini out, like, within about a year or so. And you think, well, that's kind of fast, but uh, it works for them. You know, and then, uh, you know, apparently, uh, well, can't beat their industrial design. Nobody's able to beat it yet, not even Android, so. So learning objectives are what we're going to look at today in this first lecture. Kind of looking at explaining what the information systems are. So we're, today we're going to look at the concept of information systems. And what we do, what we'll be doing in this course, and this is kind of the introduction to the course as well, is every week hit new topics. So we'll have one week on innovation, one week on, this week is going to be on information systems. Information technology will be another concept we'll look at. Engineering, manufacturing, operations, um, innovation, research development, all these like little subtopics that kind of all fit together in this broad category of topics we're looking at. So today we're kind of looking at information systems, contrasting the idea of data, technology, people, organizations, and components. Because information systems is pretty much the core of everything we're developing out there, if you think about it. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, different types of jobs, careers, opportunities, and IS and related fields, and discussing the natural nature of information systems with the successful and you know failures and successes of modern organizations. Now the lecture is a bit dated, just from 2010, which is about three years old. And I say that's a bit dated. For this type of material, it is. If this were a math textbook, it wouldn't be dated. Or if this were another topic, it would not be dated. This is dated, and we'll see we'll see why in a few minutes. But uh, Although that, I think that's a pretty current version, maybe of the iPhone, who knows, but <laughs> yeah, the, the concept doesn't change, so neither do, the, neither do the core concepts that are related in the, this particular topic area. So information systems today, well, let's see how today this is. We have the knowledge worker, and we have the knowledge society. Well, we definitely still have the knowledge society, that part's not dated, neither is knowledge worker. So if you think about the concept here, we have, uh, you know, you're managing an office place of, uh, you know, your, your new, new head of department or something or other, and you're coming in and you're thinking about it. What are you really managing? Are you really managing the people? You are kind of, but you're mostly managing knowledge, and knowledge is a combination of the people and the equipment, the computers, the software, the information systems. Uh, so the term coined uh, back in 1959, the knowledge worker. Today's environment, we're all knowledge workers, so which is kind of an interesting concept. We're creating housing and um, retaining and hopefully dissimulating knowledge among our work group. So an individual who is uh, relatively well educated and who creates, modifies, or and or synthesizes knowledge as a fundamental part of their job, that's a knowledge worker hard to walk into an engineering company and not find any knowledge workers. <laughs> I could easily walk into to a Target store. I could easily walk into like a retail store. I could easily walk into a fast food joint. I could walk into a bar, a restaurant, not find any knowledge workers. You walk into Apple, you walk into Google, you walk into any place that has technology as a core foundational competency for their company, everybody's a knowledge worker. Which means people are generally more educated, but does it really matter? It kind of contributes to their ability to work with the knowledge. But it doesn't necessarily define them as a knowledge worker. So the knowledge worker is someone who creates, modifies, synthesizes, transforms, and is a fundamental part. Knowledge is a fundamental part of their job. So as an engineering manager, you're managing knowledge workers. <laughs> These guys are not retail management. So when you think about it, do you really have to tell an engineer? when they should be taking a break, or how many, you usually have to tell them to take a break. Um, do you really have to tell, you know, some professional, you know, like get off the phone or stop text messaging? Not really. So you don't have the same people problems, 
you don't have the same like discipline and work ethic. You're you're a little bit they're a little bit higher up the food chain, so they're a little bit more mature, they're professionals, they're more educated normally. Fewer personnel issues, but doesn't mean they're not there. You still have some personnel issues. But primarily what your concern is with them and the biggest problem that you have is making them happy with their job, giving them the tools they need. So knowledge workers need tools. They need access. They need system privileges. <laughs> they need access to databases. They need new software packages. They need better running computers. They need, um, you know, handheld devices. They need all this technology. That's not only is it expensive, but then you have to figure out, well, why do you need this? And then if you're not an engineer yourself, if you're a business person, you're looking at this, that's your biggest challenge is, you know, how do we justify upgrading all the computer systems or how do we do this? Why do we need to do that kind of thing? It's kind of like, uh, you know, how uh, artists are, let's say, take a look at a photographer needs the latest and greatest photography equipment. <laughs> or, uh, you know, an engineer, is gonna, he's going to need this, you know, $200,000 piece of equipment to do something with it, you know. So that's the hardest part of a, managing a knowledge worker. It's not necessarily disciplinary stuff. It's managing the resources for the most part. We also have a knowledge society, a new economy, digital world, digital divide, as they say. We're all working in a knowledge society, actually, with a lot of uh, knowledge around us. Um, that happened when we got the Internet, actually. Um, if you remember, most of you probably don't remember, but... I don't know, if you're around my age group, you probably do remember life without computers. I don't know, maybe you guys are all younger than I am. I remember life without computers. <laughs> I remember life without the internet. <laughs> we, weren't, uh, we weren't what you would call a knowledge society. <laughs> we, were, we were, you know, the uh, Encyclopedia America guy? Britannia used to walk around door to door selling encyclopedias. No more jobs for this guy. Because, you know, if anyone wants to look something up, you go to the internet, right? So... What does that do? It actually increases our ability to find information. So along with technology becomes the responsibility of owning up to it. So as a knowledge worker or as a member of society, you're, knowledge, you're part of knowledge society, which means if you didn't catch what somebody posted or you don't know about YouTube or you don't know about this or that, you don't know about bhacker.com, you know, you're lost. You know, forget it. You, know. you might as well not even get the lecture or the syllabus for this class. Which, which makes you responsible for it as the consumer. Well, it also makes you responsible for it as the manager. So you, know, you pretty much have to keep it paced. So in our society here, the information is now important as land, labor, capital, resources. It's actually an asset. Knowledge is an asset for the company as well, which is kind of an interesting concept. Uh, when you think about, and now not to overwhelm me with too much business stuff today, but when you think about the um, intangible assets of a company, you know, it's like about goodwill, you know, customer base, you know, and, and now all the business people are like me now because, oh well, yeah, this is a business course. Well, knowledge <laughs> is also a tangible asset, intangible asset, you know. It doesn't exist, but it does exist. And if you don't, if your company doesn't have knowledge, it's not worth as much as your goodwill, actually. Your goodwill is kind of secondary right now. Your, your ability to produce a product and do it correctly and save money and run streamline is more important than anything else because it makes you last longer. So it makes you more competitive. So now we have this kind of this interesting picture here where you have the items of value for knowledge society. We've got capital on one end, land, labor. Well, this is information, information and innovation, actually. Put it up there. So. so characteristics of the digital world, because we are living in a digital world. We have the globalization, uh, no longer stuck to local areas. So globalization, integration of economics throughout the world enables technology to progress around. There's a lot of different things. In fact, you're at one of the most global university settings actually around. Couldn't pick a more international kind of place to go to school, actually. <laughs> so got people from everywhere here, which is kind of the trend, actually, in terms of education, in terms of the economy, looking at economic changes and how globalization works with technology changes. It influences also cultural changes, influence things as well. Um, in fact, there's one economist a long time ago who said if it weren't for the culture, the cultural thing, you know, technology would grow so much faster. <laughs> actually, kind of, I don't remember who said that, and I don't even want to quote it right now, but... 
I kind of think it's kind of true. I think people hold ourselves back, actually, because we think about morals and we think about dilemmas. And it had something to do with cloning sheep or something. This thing, and in fact, I think it was on a PBS episode. And it was for the fact that of the religion, I'm not going to bring up religion here or anything or humanistic rights or anything like that, but if it weren't for some of the groups that have been holding back the research and the testing on certain things, we probably would have gone, we probably would have achieved more in terms of cloning capabilities right now. Which is kind of interesting because if we think about technology and how culture and humans have held it back, we almost didn't have cell phones for the longest time because in the 1950s in this country, in the United States, they wanted to blow up the satellites because we weren't using them. <laughs> we had junk in the waste. We had junk out in the atmosphere. We put up a bunch of satellites and they were sitting there un empty, not being used, and they were considered space junk. And the green people, I'm a green person, so don't, don't think I'm criticizing green people, they wanted us to get rid of the junk. Okay, and the government said, no, 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 it costs too much money, and we're just going to send all this waste down into the atmosphere. It's going to be bad for us, blah, 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 blah. Fought, fought for years on that. Well, it's a good thing we left them. We wouldn't have cellular service in this country <laughs> because it's all working off those satellites. So they made use of the satellites. But the technology and innovation on that was held back for the longest time, and it almost didn't exist because we were working against it. So it's kind of interesting how that actually works in a company as well, and there's many different examples of how humans and culture kind of work for and against some technology changes, some innovations, and then how the globalization has influenced a lot of things. So it's just kind of interesting. We have a lot of technology from abroad that's come to the U.S. and vice versa. So, And uh, the idea of everyone working against each other still sort of exists. You may not see it from an outsider's point of view, but as a native from this country, we have a lot of competition. This group doesn't like that group who doesn't like that group. And there's a lot of Americans who don't like anyone who's not part of this country. And I'm thinking, you guys are just it's like those green people on those satellites. You're just going to hold us back. <laughs> so so uh, the companies who have uh, taken advantage of globalization, who have used outsourcing to their advantage, I mean, I could, from a, okay, okay a slight tangent, I'll just talk about outsourcing for a second because I mentioned it. Uh, Slight tangent, I can tell you the American, because I'm on, sitting on the other side of the fence here, I can tell you the American view of outsourcing. You, you, you query 10 people on the street, you find the Americans, especially the Californians, they don't like outsourcing. They don't like outsourcing because they think it's taken away all their jobs. I'm thinking if your job could be outsourced, maybe you should be doing a different job. <laughs> so, because the outsourcing, actually the insourcing, so insourcing is another problem that they have. So uh, for the longest time, you guys probably don't know this because you're all not from here, but if you were here about 10 years ago, we had call centers here. Like in California, HP would have their call center. IBM would have their call. What do you mean by call center? You like people call in, you know, and you answer, hello, customer support, tech support, stuff like that. So about 10 years ago, everything was here, and then everything went elsewhere. Well, the thing is, is we get people with better English skills in Nebraska who do most of the telecommunications call center support. We get like the Expedias and the HPs that are all in Costa Rica, third party, third world countries, you know, put it out, get it out of here. It makes jobs for other people, right? If you're thinking about globalization, if you're thinking about the world all working together, it creates jobs for people elsewhere that may not necessarily have jobs. It makes it so that these people here can do other jobs. <laughs> Who wants to sit around and answer the telephone all day? It's not like what you're here for. In fact, you're not going to be working in a call center if you're going and getting a master's degree. You shouldn't be, I hope. But however, a lot of Americans have figured that out, and they have retired to these countries, and they've taken call center jobs, <laughs> which I think is just kind of like funny. <laughs> Because they complain about all the jobs going away, and then they leave and they take the job <coughs> elsewhere. So, yeah, for the longest time, HP was the company was doing it. It was hiring locals who wanted to relocate to, you know, tropical islands. You know, they're retired. They, they don't want to work anymore, but they still need the money. So, But they have really nice English-speaking skills. So you take them out you put them in another country, and they get to retire and go on vacation. And they still have a job, which I think is just 
hilarious actually. But um, anyway, yeah, if you query one of you know average American on the street, they still don't like outsourcing. But outsourcing has has made things cheaper. It has you know utilized economies of scale. You know made jobs elsewhere. You know, it's done so much for the country. So anyway, I'm probably the only one who thinks that way. So. Let's talk about economic changes, <laughs> which is what I've been talking about, actually. Uh, globalization in terms of uh, cultural changes, and you know, so this one here was on integration of economics throughout the world, enabling technologies and progress of technology. Well, we also have the economical changes, being able to help out another country, uh, be also being able to utilize skill. In fact, um, a lot of the you know programmers here really complain. You know, they say, oh, you know, all my source code is being outsourced. You know, to to this Asian company or to this, you know, some some place in India or someplace. You know, all they're they're making. The thing is, it's cheaper, <laughs> or it used to be cheaper. Not so much cheaper anymore. So now it's all coming back. But for the longest time, it was very inexpensive to have something written. In fact, I've worked for companies and had stuff written like a two weeks time. It would take an American to do like over a couple of months. They just whipped it out. So it's like wow, it's fast, it's cheap, it's good. I don't care about that. So, not that it took jobs away from my friends or anything, but <laughs> get another job. <laughs> so. All right. So, economic changes, increases in international trade of goods and services, jobs, stuff like that. Cultural changes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cultural changes having to do with uh, globalization. Usually, increase in access to other cultures through television, internet, and so on. Uh, the internet pretty much has done that for us. Um, in fact, uh, has made it easier for foreigners to travel. It made it easier. I mean, I can, you know, use the internet and I can go anywhere I want and feel like I'm at home. I can watch my TV shows just as if I was sitting in my own living room, you know. I um, mean, you guys, I can watch everybody else's shows. I can pick up a station somewhere else for internet, TV, and stuff. Technology changes. Yep. Technology ability, low cost competing platforms. Communication technologies, voice over IP is a good example of that, actually. Um, so a lot of the driving factors and what we're looking at are some of the driving factors that have been underneath and have been associated with globalization as a concept. So, Which is all part of innovation, which is all part of engineering management. You think about it as a concept. So what's an information system? There's three components of an information system. Let's just kind of flip up the topic a little bit here. Input processing and output. <laughs> it's kind of like the three components of software engineering, input processing and output. We have something, well, and problem solving. We take data, raw facts, information. Well, we take data, which is raw facts, numbers. We stick it into a system, we process it, and we come out with information. We take the information, we add it with more information, and we come up with knowledge. We take the knowledge, add more information to it, then we get wisdom. So it's like the knowledge hierarchy. Not on the slide, don't worry about it. It's coming up, though. <laughs> so, uh, which is what we're doing in engineering. So we're solving a problem or we're making, uh, we're making something. So you can make information real easily doing that, just taking facts and numbers and processing it. So we have a combination of five key elements that are part of the definition of information systems because it's more than just the system. It's the people, the hardware, the software, the telecommunications networks. It's the big package. It's everything being put together. So here we have the telecommunications people, the data, the information system in the middle here. So it all works together. So the root and purpose of the information system, well, if you think about it, here's the hierarchy I just gave you a few minutes ago. So data is the lowest level. So a lot of uh, information systems textbooks draw this like a pyramid. And they put the data on the bottom because it's the biggest section. So if you imagine a pyramid, it kind of looks like that. You kind of look at it. At the top is the wisdom because it's the smallest little tip. <laughs> we have more volume as we go down. So we have information in the middle and we have data on the bottom. We have a lot of data in this world. There's a ton of data, tons of facts and numbers. In fact, the Internet is full of data. So how do you make information out of that? You have to process the data. You have to add it all up and say our year-to-date sales are this. And then that turns into information. And to say that our sales are growing or our sales are not growing. 
Oh, that turns into wisdom <laughs> eventually when you figure out how to make money or you figure out how to analyze the data correctly to get the right information and make the right decisions, which is how you end up acquiring knowledge. So data is raw, unformatted information. Example, here's a number. And the information is the meaning behind the data. So you take the data, add some meaning to it. So the data that is transformed to have a meaning to it. Well, what is that? Well, here's the raw number. Now this is a telephone number. Well, look at that. It's a telephone number. <laughs> so we have information. And then we have wisdom is, you know, knowledge, knowing how to dial the telephone number, <laughs> knowing what to do with it. And then wisdom, knowing enough to call them again. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's like you know, the body of governing the procedures used to organize, manipulate the data, and then the accumulated knowledge turns into the wisdom. So there's a parallel to this out in the real world for humans. So this is the, it's more the scientific approach to it. So here's the parallel for humans. So it mimics the human life cycle. So information systems and technology. So you're going to walk out today going, what in the world? Mimics human development. It's an example of human development life cycle. What does that mean? You're born into the world. What do you get? Nothing. You don't have anything. But you pick data up. You know, hot, cold. The first time everybody in here has burned themselves at least one time, has frozen some body part, has touched something that was full of electricity, has experienced everything, usually, hopefully by the time you get out of high school, <laughs> grade school. But you don't know what it is until you see it, and then you formulate the information for it. For example, the first time you burn yourself. So you look... You're a kid, usually it's the stove or it's a candle, it's a household item because that's where the kids are normally residing and usually. Or it could be outside, playing with matches or something. So you figure out what hot is and what cold is, well that's information. It comes from data, the data is you touched it and you went, ah! You know? <laughs> or somebody hit you because you almost touched it. And you didn't touch it, but you almost did, so you got hit. So you got negative stimulus that came and was associated with that. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. The kids still got to burn themselves. Because how do you know what it feels like to get burned? And I guarantee everyone here has burnt themselves before. <laughs> so you know. And you've stepped on something barefoot. Because then you know what to walk on, what not to walk on. And maybe you did it in combination, actually. You probably stepped on a hot pavement in the middle of summer and burned your from the bottom of your foot, or you got stung by a bee, or you didn't get stung by a bee, or you got sick, or you, something happens to you. You accumulate enough data to put the pieces together to go, oh, don't eat that, I'm allergic to that, or don't touch that. And then you apply the stimulus to new items. So you first you, you burn yourself, or you look at a candle, and then you say, oh, hot stove. So you sense the heat, you get the data, you sense, you feel it, or you come close to it, you feel it, uh-oh. And then you know, oh, don't touch that. I'm going to burn myself, which is kind of interesting. So that mimics technology, <laughs> believe it or not, in information systems, because that's what companies do. If you think about the science of it all, um, companies, let's say, for example, Apple has figured out, well, the accumulated data, you know, in terms of what people like, and their core competency is industrial design. So they know, how do they know that we like a wheel? Because remember the old Sony, uh, if you remember this, maybe you haven't, I don't know, the old Sony cassette players, you know, the buttons, they were boxy. They were buttons that, you know, with hard movements and stuff like that. Well, they took that and they made the exact opposite of that because nobody liked that. <laughs> and lo and behold, people liked it. So because, you know, the data gives you, and, you know, going back to this whole evolution of humans, well, they took the data of all of the bad sales of that and all the, you know, how cheap that looks and, you know, coloring. They, they actually did a lot of psychology tests as well and stuff like that. And then they accumulated all this data to turn into information to know, and they have the information and they have the knowledge to build products that nobody else can build, if you think about it, because their engineers have specialized in this. It's industrial design, but it has a lot of research associated with it and has a lot of technology that uh, goes along with it that kind of mimics how we all learned how what fire was. So believe it or not, that's what companies do. And they call it research, <laughs> development. Well, isn't that what you're developing as a child? You're developing through research. 
you know, it's kind of the same process anyway, long story short. Uh, and if you do that enough, then you get really knowledgeable. And then once they, you know, and they always say that the old wise men, why, why are they always old? I guess because they've been going through life and they've experienced so much and they have all this knowledge. And then they get really old and they turn wise, which is kind of kind of like a fake assumption because not all old people are wise. And not all wise people are old. So, uh, go figure. Depends on how much you've experienced in life, I guess, in terms of how knowledgeable how wisdom you are. I can go down to the local jack-in-the-box and I can find some pretty old people that aren't very wise. <laughs> Not to discriminate against fast food workers, but usually if you have an education, you're not going to work in fast food around here. So, All right, so let's go on to another topic. <laughs> so, Here's our data, our information, our knowledge, and our wisdom. And this is another example that says, you know, here's a data and we turn it into information, well, we turn it into a telephone number, and then we turn it into knowledge and say, well, that's John Doe's telephone number. And then we turn it into wisdom. We said, John Doe, if he has this telephone number, we can probably find his school records, his employment records, his medical records, and now i got more information that's associated with it just by knowing John Doe kind of thing, which is kind of interesting. So that's what you guys are doing in school, by the way. So you go to school not to learn facts and numbers and stuff because you already did that. So now you have the information, so now you're, what you're trying to do is become knowledgeable by learning multiple disciplines. So some of you switch majors, you start in with this field and you go into another field. A lot of engineering management people are coming from all different disciplines which is kind of interesting. And then by com combining the different fields <coughs> you get this knowledge and borderlining into wisdom at this point because you have the experience in both, so, which is good. So the unformatted versus the formatted versus the data relationship. So you can look at it this way too. If you don't like my examples so far, you can say, well, data is just unformatted raw facts and numbers and figures. And information is the formatted data. And then the knowledge is the data relationship, the data that the data has with other data. So that's kind of like, you know, if you know that it's January and you know that it's snowing outside and you know that the Christmas season just ended, so, and you know that next season coming up is probably going to be spring, most places. You're going to have a sale on all your winter stuff. Because <laughs> it's going to be hard to get rid of it anyway. Or, you know, in the middle of August when the sales of the bathing suits come on. <laughs> because, you know, if you keep it, it's gonna, gonna, you're going to spend too much money storing it all year. Better to get rid of it than it is to pay for the inventory weight all season. So if you work in sales, you have the whole cycle. Well, what is that? That's knowledge. Knowledge knowing that if things aren't moving at a certain pace, then you know that there's going to be a problem another month from now. So engineering managers, what are they imagining people? So you got a guy who doesn't show up to work very much, who's been sick chronically, and your database project is a week behind right now, and soon to be two weeks behind. I'd fire that guy, or I'd get rid of him. I'd hire another guy, bring another guy in. <laughs> Because you know that project's not going to complete on time. Because just the signs. So how do you know that? Because then the optimistic person will go, Oh no, he's just sick. He'll be back. Give the guy a break. He's just sick. No. <laughs> so it depends. So if you've seen it happen before, you know, it's like a stock market crash for stock market people. They know the signs, you know. It's been going down, it's been going down, it's been going down. Oh, no, now the crops, uh, we have a storm in the mid up, Midwest, and this is going to happen. They, they put all the pieces together, and then they have the knowledge or the wisdom. They go, get rid of that stock. Buy that stock, sell that stock. Is it a gamble? No, it's a calculated risk. So, And it's actually knowledge. It's not a flip a coin. There's some really stupid people that just flip coins all the time. I mean, do you know what I mean by flipping coins? <laughs> It's guesstimating. Uh, hmm, get a new job? No. Hire that guy? Fire that guy? I don't know. Because <laughs> they don't have the knowledge and they don't even have the facts or the numbers or the figures. They don't have anything. So they just flip a coin. They go, okay, let's do it. <clears throat> so information, that's information systems, by the way. Information systems takes and creates wisdom from data. And it's the system that puts it all together. Then we have this thing called information technology. That works with this. So information technology is also a component of the information systems. We need the technology 
So relationship with the computer-based information system of the information technology and technology in general. Well, would technology exist without information systems? Sure, why not? We have tons of calculators out there. In fact, we have tons of accounting programs out there. We have tons of CAD programs out there. Actually, we have a million different versions of CAD programs out there. But if you don't know, if you don't know, have any architectural background, <laughs> do you, can you actually write one? It's kind of like how people take technology, like for example, a student, you guys. You are at, let's put you back 20 years or so. You're in high school or you're, or maybe lower than that, in grade school or something. And they gave you a word processor. Can you write a research paper? Or maybe some of you now, can you write a master's thesis? Can you write a dissertation if I give you Microsoft Word? Probably not. Unfortunately, that's how companies approach co uh, technology and business. They provide their staff with computers. They buy expensive accounting system programs. They buy, you know, expensive PeopleSoft and SAP and stuff, and yet nobody knows what to do with it. <laughs> it's like giving you a word processor and telling you to write a PhD dissertation. Uh, what are you going to do with it? So unfortunately, that's how the relationship of technology comes into businesses these days. Uh, or you hire someone guy who knows how to work Microsoft Word but doesn't know how to write a grant proposal or doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> unfortunately, that's very common, unfortunately, uh, which is the problem with information technology. It describes most of the management issues of related to engineering management with that. Because what ends up happening is you're going to be stuck in a situation where, oh, we bought this new software. Uh, okay, It's not a matter of getting the people trained on it. So why did you even buy the software? Or maybe you bought the wrong software. You know, maybe you don't need this, you need something else completely. And, but you haven't really thought about it because no one did a cost-benefit analysis. Nobody did a needs assessment. Nobody did anything. That's what, as an engineering manager, that's what you do. <laughs> so the job of the engineering management person, manager, is to come through and say, what do we need with technology? What kind of people do we have? So it's people-oriented, technology-oriented, information systems-oriented marketing oriented, sales oriented. There's so many different little facets. But eventually you're going to get stuck in a situation where they're going to say, well, we have this vendor, we have that vendor, and we have that vendor. Which one would, would you think we want to get? And it's your job to kind of go, well, this one because of this reason and that one because of that reason. So you have to be kind of up to speed on technology and innovation, but you also have to be a good manager at the same time which is kind of an interesting skill set when you think about it, because usually people are one or the other. So technology, information technology, and computer-based systems all work together. In terms of the technology component, any machine that can supply or supplement or replace human manual work is technology. By its definition, I know it's kind of a pretty broad definition. But examples would be a heating system, surgical laser, I would hope there's a doctor <laughs> operating that surgical laser. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, well, that, you know, automatic temperature controller is going to the heating system. That's technology. So knowing that uh, you put a sensor in a building, just like for air conditioning and stuff, you know, or for heating systems, that's information technology because it's taking in the current temperature and turning on the air con or turning it off, giving it a certain temperature, ideal rating or setting that you want. Well, surgical laser, you know, scribing machines, all sorts of different components that people use in their jobs, or information technology that's associated with their job usually. That's replacing a human or helping them be better humans kind of thing. So it's not a cell phone. <laughs> that's a, well, so when I teach a technology information when I, when I teach ITIS classes, usually um, at a different school, actually, I teach information systems courses. And people usually think, well, the cell phone is like the most ideal information system. I'm thinking, that doesn't matt, that doesn't. That, that the cell phone is an extension of your brain, by the way. <laughs> it's not technology. Whatever you have on that phone is something you knew at one time. You stuck, you stuck people's telephone numbers in there, some people's addresses in there. It's like, it's a big overflow of your brain. Because it's funny because when people lose the phone, they lose their brain. 
What's this number? I don't know. It's on my phone. And I lost my phone. My phone's at home. And then you feel detached from your own brain when you can't even find your phone. It's not technology. It is because, well, no, it's not technology. And people think it is because it's like an extension, I guess, of themselves. It's a phone. It's kind of like, is, is a toaster technology? <laughs> Hey, you think about it, it is kind of like it, but what does it do? Could you take the same piece of bread and stick it out in the, underneath a hot day on a hot pavement? Of course, I picked the coldest day of the year to use this example, but if you stuck it outside, you could fry an egg on the sidewalk sometimes. <laughs> Toast a piece of bread. It's not like modern science. So there's a kind of an interesting thing because about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people would argue with me on that one and say, oh no, it's technology. Well, some people would say the same thing about the cell phone about 20 years ago. Oh, that's technology. So it's interesting how technology, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is I'm kind of bringing up a little parallel here, that, that technology changes in according to your perspective. Something that I think is technology, you know, like my grandparents would probably go, oh my god, yeah, that's way technology, that's a high tech, you know. Remember the word high tech. <laughs> High tech came out when computers came out. Is, that, is the internet really that much technology these days? I don't think so, but I have a warped perception of technology. I don't think anything is technology anymore. But a lot of people disagree with me. They say the cell phone's technology. It's an extension of your brain, really. It's just like a notepad. Do you think writing something down on do you think a pen is technology? Of course, you know, if you go back to the the, the light bulb. Thomas Edison, you know, do you really think that the light bulb is technology today? Yeah, it is, sort of, but isn't it more of a science? Like, you know, we figured out how to, how to conduct electricity. We figured out how to make something illuminate. So, I don't know. Perspective, I guess, is you have to be there when it's invented to consider it technology. Mm. There's a lot of products on the market, you know, like the Pet Rock. Is that technology? <laughs> you guys know about the Pet Rock? Like a cheetah pet? Bad audience. <laughs> Wrong audience for that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, you people used to take, you guys, I seriously never heard of the pet rock. You know how the guy made over a million, he gave like $5 million on this pet rock. You know what he did? He went outside and grabbed a bunch of rocks and painted them and stuck them in little boxes and sold them. Rocks. <laughs> Yeah, you just pick them up out of the ground and you paint them. Or you know, actually, some of them weren't even painted in the beginning. You just stuck them in a little box and put a pet rock on the side of it and sold it for like ten or fifteen dollars or something. Not a bad concept, really, and not really technology according to me, but it was very technical at the time, I guess. This is about twenty years ago. And then the chia pet. It's the. Uh, what do they call those things? A terracotta pot. Absorbs water. You know, you put some seeds in there, and it grows. <laughs> you know, it grows hair. Well, it's just um, it's uh, sprouts actually. You just put sprouts on a on a, outside of a terracotta thing, and call it a chia pet. It turns into a pet. So. Well, okay. Compare that with the Sony dog. You guys remember the dog Sony put out? The pet, or the electronic dog fetches, and you gave it a name, or a Cabbage Patch got doll. And the, you know, they had birth certificates and stuff. Those are like those made people retire. Those are like those are, those people like made millions on that, billions on that stuff. <laughs> anyway, how does it go with engineering management? It does. It's a industrial engineering, or I don't know, it's engineering to a certain point. Is it? I don't know. Good question. Type of technology that is controlled by or uses information as an example here, manufacturing robot. So we have different technology. I was talking about products before. Now we could take and uh, automate our manufacturing, our supply chain. Actually, we can automate our supply chain through technology. It's called uh, supply chain management systems. You know, people can electronically exchange through it without any humans being involved. It's kind of like eBay if you think about it. I don't know if I'd call it eBay technology, but a lot of people would, actually. Online auction systems. Apply it towards a, an engineering setting, and you turn into supply chain management. So now we have a systems using computers to provide useful data to people. Uh, isn't that your GPS? <laughs> isn't that your cell phone? 
You know, the text messages. Who, who, who carries that text message from point A to point B? <laughs> Somebody has to work really hard to deliver that text message. It's the computer. So it gives it to you. You don't even have to ask for it. It just arrives at your phone. So that's your computer doing it for you. Specialized software uses to analyze data, stock market numbers. Actually, there's people that, um, uh, blind people, there's an, app, there's an app out there where they just wave the phone in front of stuff and it tells them what it is. Yeah, it's like you, you just, some, there's like a little armband thing you can put on. It says, chair, window, person, you know, oh, person? Are you? <laughs> you know, just and then you can identify, you know, and, and especially for people who are not necessarily blind, they pick up a can, they don't know what's in the can. So you just put it and says tomato sauce, you know, or whatever it is. So it's not a bad thing. It uses the camera, it takes a picture of it, analyzes it. So that's the computer telling the human who can't see you know, what they're looking at <coughs> and what they're using. So all right, so jobs and careers and opportunities, information system, and related fields. So we have uh, the builders and the managers of information systems and technology and engineering management, career opportunities. Well, this is where I say the stuff's going to be dated. This lecture is from 2010, I believe. 2010, so we're looking at three years ago. So IT analyst jobs, managers, 10 best jobs. You know what? It still is, actually. It's, it, so that hasn't really changed. It's still the top 10 jobs. Medium incomes, maybe that's gotten a little bit higher, actually, even in, in the bad economy. So the even in this really bad economy in the U.S., which is really isn't as bad as it was a year ago, the jobs have kind of maintained itself in certain areas. Not all areas, but in certain areas. I don't know about that one. Though. That seems kind of low to me. 49,000 seems kind of low. So. Uh, we're still getting, we're not getting as many stock benefits, stuff like that either, though, because mm -hmm. stock market kind of, kind of isn't really holding its own these days. And the whole IP thing, it's kind of like when uh, Facebook went public, you know, people were so disappointed when the stock dropped to nothing after that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want Facebook stock for? I think that's kind of like a fad from the past, actually. <laughs> so, like, people don't like stock anymore. So. Software engineer is still number one ranked, actually. If you go to this Best Jobs from Money Magazine, go to this link, probably still does exist. Probably can get updated figures. I want to see that the numbers are probably different, but the ordering of the lists probably, I don't know if I'd put college professor up there. I'd move down a little bit, but uh, that's dropped a little bit. But software engineering is still pretty much up there. So is information and computer technology, IT, IS. Because now we all have these little cloud services. IT people fall into the cloud provider realm, which is an area of uh, strong, strong growth right now. Everything's gone cloud-based. So there's a lot of um, IT consultants that go out to companies and provide cloud solutions, and everyone makes money with that. So it's huge growth right now in the States. Um, software engineering is still pretty high, even though we don't have any programming. You don't say programming on here at all. <laughs> Not going to see it's been outsourced for the most part, but you don't want to you don't want to go to school and be a programmer. You want to be a software engineer if you're going to do it. So, um, physician assistant, yeah, I don't know, restaurant market research, market analyst, uh, psychologist is still in the top ten. Uh, careers and salaries. Well, let's not look at the salary, but the national kind of thing in terms of IS activities, developing, maintaining, managing. We're still looking at IS managers and directors, sort of uh, not so good. Well, kind of in the middle, I guess. So. Careers in information system, evolution of the CIO, chief information officer. If you're an engineering manager, this is, this is your topest, your highest position. <laughs> you're going to be the CIO. That's as high as you can get. I mean, unless you become the CEO, but you're usually the CIO. Chief Information Officer, and unfortunately, you can't. It's it's all labeled information. It's either labeled information or it's labeled technology. So you could be a CTO, Chief Technology Officer. <laughs> so, job title becomes popular in 1980s or the 1990s. People joked that CIO stands for Career is Over. <laughs> so, it might be over. <laughs> well, where else are you gonna go? Your career is pretty much over with when you make it to the CIO level. 
heightened budgets, overblown expectations. Today's most largest organizations have CIOs or an equivalent position, business innovation leader, which is actually kind of funny. They've taken, <coughs> they've taken engineering out of the picture because as soon as you put that label on there, it's like, you know what a sanitation engineer is? He, he mops the floors. <laughs> or a computer engineer. And no offense to anyone who's a computer engineering man. You fix computers. You're a computer tech. It's so degraded in terms of the connotations associated with the word engineering. You might as well just take it out completely. So a lot of engineering managers, they're product innovators. They're marketing innovators. So the word innovation I highlighted here is pretty much the new word or technology instead of the word engineering because uh, it's uh, there's less connotation to it in terms of sweeping the floors because for the longest time, when you know what happened is society did that for the longest time, everybody was an engineer. I'm a teacher engineer. Well, I'm a sanitation engineer. Well, I'm a food court engineer. <laughs> well, I do the I do the the food truck engineer. <laughs> You just sell food out of a truck. <laughs> oh, now I'm a light. Well, I shouldn't go into those. I'm going to offend half the majors in this room. A software engineer. What does a software engineer really do? There's, I mean, do you, I mean, I guess there's there's software development. There's software, Q, there's QA. There's programming. But how do you really, I mean, there is a such title as a software engineer, but it's so broad. It's broader, almost, well, just as broad as engineering manager. So. Changing trends, higher prestige, more women. Yes, more women in the work face, workplace. That's good. Nerdy. This guy's supposed to look nerdy, and this guy's supposed to look sophisticated. <laughs> they both look nerdy to me. I don't know. But this guy's supposed to be like computer geek because he's got glasses on and his shirt's buttoned up, no tie. <laughs> this guy's got a tie on, and he doesn't wear glasses anymore. He's got contacts. And then we had one guy sitting in the back gluing pencils together. <laughs> and then we have the entire team integrated with you know, women, I guess, in there. So, Yeah. This is like about a 20-year-old slide. <laughs> Still from about two years ago, three years ago, 2010. So. What makes IS personnel valuable? Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the people side of this here. We have technical competency, business competency, and systems competency. Well, this is actually the same thing you need for engineering management, actually. So you need to, you don't have to be good. You could be a jack of all trades, but you still have to know something about technology or be able to bluff your way through an interview or at least be familiar with the technology that you're working with. <laughs> you know, if, if you're working for a company that makes lasers or something, you have to have some laser background taking a class in it or something. You don't have to be an expert on it to be an engineering manager, though, to be a laser manager. You don't have to be an expert. You'll never touch it. That's what everybody else does. And unfortunately, you have to accept the fact that you're probably going to make less than the people that do touch the lasers. <laughs> Those people will always make more. So you're not to diminish your hope at all of being an engineering manager, but you never want to be an engineering manager. <laughs> you're going to be the lowest paid person in the department which is kind of terrible, but it's, it's probably the less pressure, more entertaining job because you're never responsible for anything. You're just like the buffer between the higher management and the engineers. So you've got to get them to do what they're supposed to do. You have to get the engineers to do what they're supposed to do, and you have to appease the higher management. Oh, yeah, they're on schedule. No problem. You get a really good team. Your job's a piece of cake. You could probably do multiple jobs at the same time. Get a really bad team, you're not going to stay at that company for too long because they're going to get rid of you. So it's, it's not, uh, it takes a lot of uh, different skill sets, but you can be a jack of all trades. You don't have to really be good at any, you don't have to be a good manager. You don't have to be a good engineer. You don't have to be a good manager. <laughs> all you have to do is be able to kind of be buffer between everybody. It's kind of like uh, project managers. If anyone has ever worked as a project manager, you're like that peanut butter and jelly in a sandwich. You know, you're like stuck in between. <laughs> you're the cheese on the patty melt. <laughs> you got pressure from both sides and the heat from both sides. 
You got everybody on your team who's like not performing well. You got everybody. Is it ready yet? Are we on schedule? So you're like the buffer in between. That's what you do as an engineering manager as well. Most of those, ninety percent of all those jobs out there, are your, you're the cheese on a cheese toast. <laughs> So what do you need in terms of skill set? Integrated knowledge and skills in three different areas. <clears throat> All right, so hardware, software, networking, security. It depends on the industry you're working in. Business competency, that's more important than technical competency, actually. Understanding the nature of business, key technical competencies. System competency is understanding how to build large grade upscaled systems. Systems competency is kind of interesting. You have to actually be one of those people. In the old days, they used to be like PC Mag, and there was like these publications. That, it's something like Time Magazine. You guys heard of Time Magazine? Well, if you're an econ major, <laughs> or finance major, you have like a monthly subscription. It shows up once a week. Um, there used to be all that printed stuff. Now you have to do it all online. The only problem with the online, it's not the equivalent. The quality of those articles went downhill and just took it online. But trade magazines, peer-reviewed magazines, where you're keeping up with what everybody's doing. That's what you need in terms of systems competencies. You need to know that PeopleSoft has an upgrade out or something, or that this system has been introduced and now people like it better than that other system over there. Because further down the road, you might need that for something. So it's kind of like how people used to read Time magazine because it kept them up to speed. Hot skills. Let's see how outdated this is. Uh, yeah, it's not outdated. It's pretty good. So hot skill here, enterprise architecture, project leadership, management skills, cold programming. You don't need to be, you don't have to know anything about programming these days. Not for engineering management. Now, in fact, even if you're working in software engineering, you don't have to know that much about programming because there's never going to be a time unless that you're working for a very small company that you're going to write a line of code. It's outsourced. <laughs> so don't have to worry about that. Uh, routine coding, cold. What it means cold here means put it on the back burner. Not such a hot thing to know these days. Project planning, budgeting, scheduling, yes more so than any of these skill sets over here. Uh, systems testing, not so much. There are a dime a dozen QA people, testing people. There's too many people in the working in this area. So it's better to have these skill sets over here, which is mostly business related. Systems analysis, systems design. IT security. Security is still pretty hot. Uh, <coughs> storage administration, not so hot anymore. About two or three years ago, storage when clouds just started becoming uh, mainstream. <coughs> yeah, cloud technology is kind of a dime and a dozen as well. I mean, it's not that uh, not that prevalent. It's, you can actually go out and get Amazon servers, you know, within about an hour, have your system already set up, your cloud configured. There's no skill set involved with that anymore. <laughs> Uh, artificial intelligence, yes. Web mining, yes. Data warehouse. I would take this business intelligence and move it up, but it's just in a different category in terms of its domain. And say that this is the super hot area, actually. Web, web mining, data mining, data warehousing, business intelligence. Because we've already figured out how to make it all electronic. We've already figured out the technology for it. And now we have to figure out how to make it work our, worth our while. So the context of information systems and technology in terms of organizations, <clears throat> many different types of systems. So we have transaction processing sy systems, decision support systems, intelligence systems. So one of the things you need to do, or you'll need to do if you especially do like a department type management position, is figure out what systems are working. <laughs> and then making the systems work together with the other systems. And then depending upon what area that you're working in, if you're working in manufacturing or something of that nature, <clears throat> making sure you have your supply chain integrated with your everything else you're doing in terms of inventory or in terms of manufacturing run. So mm -hmm. Systems can be cleanly categorized. Now the boundaries are fading due to internet working and system integration. Actually, the boundaries are really fading between these different systems more so than they were ten two years ago. So. So the uh, function, <coughs> in early, <coughs> early history, we had poor service, worse attitudes. Systems were hard to use, over budget, late. 
And we had the rise and fall of the end user development. Modern information systems organizations, attitudes have changed, services mentality has uh, emerged. So, actually, I'd focus down here on the modern kind of environment where we have software as a service, as a cloud service mentality. So, actually, most companies are gone this route now. <clears throat> Even Microsoft is attempting to do this with the Microsoft Office, what's it called, 370 or 360, 360 something. Uh, not this release, but probably the next one of it. Kind of a completely cloud-based. So you don't install anything. You just subscribe to it. So if you're working in a software company, you got to take this kind of modern approach to it. If you don't, you're not working in modern times. <laughs> so if you work in terms of software as a service, um, if you're going to be working in engineering management at all, it's probably worth your while to take a couple of cloud courses. Networking and cloud technology. Because if you're going to work with software, you're going to need that. Everything is done that way. So, <clears throat> Not so much end-user development. We've had a lot of end-user development for the longest time. The advent of the IBM PC early applications package led to end-user development. Man, that's an old picture. That looks like the IBM PC Junior or something. The old floppy drives. <laughs> I like looking at these old pictures because it brings back like, wow. Remember when we moved over, we didn't have notebook computers. We have computers that look like that. <laughs> Actually, there's an old bank, um, Bank of the West, where I live around the block. It has these little terminals out in the back. And I was going to look at that and go, wow, why do they keep them out there? Because people, it's interesting. People look over there, wow, look at that. <laughs> I haven't seen one of those in years. So. Other issues facing the IS function, the spread of technology in organizations, <coughs> downsizing, right-sizing, and outsourcing of jobs, routine jobs. Yeah, outsourcing is still prevalent for uh, routine jobs. And as I say, if you're doing a job that can be outsourced, maybe you shouldn't be doing that job. Maybe you should be doing something else. It's like the typist when word processors came around. Maybe you shouldn't be a typist. Then maybe you shouldn't be a word processor. Maybe you shouldn't be a data entry person. Maybe you shouldn't be a call center person. You know? Maybe you shouldn't be a programmer. Maybe you shouldn't be a teacher. <laughs> you know, no, that can go away too. Actually, it has massive online, open online courses. I don't even need to be standing here anymore. I could just show you a video. Is it the same though? I don't know. Probably better. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Career prospects and opportunities and need for people for organizations with analytical skills. So yeah, all the gloom and doom about all the jobs have gone away. Great. So people with analytical skills, people with thinking skills, thinking humans have a ton of jobs. There's a ton of jobs for those people. The only problem is now you just can't graduate from high school in this country and get a job. You actually have to go to college and learn a skill. So. You guys don't know this, but like <clears throat> in this country, like 1940s, 1950s, people didn't go to college. My parents didn't go to college. I, my, neither one of my parents have a college degree. But when they graduated, they didn't need it. What did they need it for? They just got themselves jobs. <laughs> yeah, I think they were a little uh, spoiled or something. <laughs> now you can't get a job without a college degree. Neither one of my parents have a college degree. My, my grandparents didn't even have finished high school. <laughs> but you don't need that. What do you need it for? And they both actually had pretty good, they, they had pretty, they, they're both retired now. My parents are retired, but they had made pretty good living. They afforded, they had a good retirement home, they, you know, made a really good life for themselves without college degrees. <laughs> I'm talking bachelor's degrees, they didn't even, anyway. It, you, people at this point usually ask me, well, what did they do? <laughs> they own their own business. Well, they had their own business, a flower shop actually. Worked a flower shop for 30 years, 40 years. They made enough money to retire. All right, dual nature of IS. <laughs> So we have, IS can make you or break you. Uh, London, Heathrow, a failure. Well, bar, baggage handling. Oh, Heathrow Airport. I guess they had a failure with the baggage handling. Hmm. People get this with ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems. In fact, um, there was a retail chain around here that did that. Installed a retail, and they, they paid like a couple hundred thousand dollars for this ERP system, put it in, a year later took it out because it was costing them more money than it was making them. 
and it was a retail chain that had and the problem was something had to do with like the inventory cycles or something it was making too many mistakes so the technology was like ruining their business uh, let's see this guy had a disaster at the airport looks like FedEx the success FedEx actually this is a good story actually information hubs for businesses managing information in business I don't know if any of you guys were around in the states back maybe back where you're from when you get an overnight package delivered they have you sign for something yeah, you know, and they leave the package, and then like another day or so down the road, you could you know get a receipt if you wanted it. Or at the end of the day, the driver used to go back to the central office or whatever and enter in the. Somebody would enter that stuff in overnight, and they'd unload the trucks and load the trucks. So now you can tell like you know with electronic signatures and instant updating. Five minutes after the package is delivered, you can find out that it got delivered, or you can get an email sent to you or something like that. That technology revolutionized package handling, overnight deliveries. They were going broke. It's kind of like the post office needs to do something like this. <laughs> well, you know the U.S. post office is on bankruptcy at this point. They're, now I think they're threatening to close service on the weekends or something. You know, just keep, which is they shouldn't be open on Saturdays. Just, just close. Or maybe it was like a four-day week instead of a five-day week or something. Anyway, long story short. The package handlers, because of the competition among Federal Express, UPS, all of the overnight deliveries, it was getting real competitive. Was, everyone was driving the cost down. So in order to save costs, they improved the service accidentally. Um, they made it so that they could get rid of all of their overnight staff. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of paying people to enter in stuff into a computer after the trucks come back or to unload the truck, reload it up, stuff like that, they don't do any of that stuff anymore. They got rid of all those people. Now, if they put in technology, there's a radio receiver on the truck, automatically, as soon as the package delivered, automatically gets updated, put into the computer, takes all those people's, all those jobs away. The stuff never leaves the truck. They know exactly what's on the truck. So you can call in and say, hey, I don't want to pick it up, and I want to pick it up, don't let them deliver it. They just take the ones that are going to stay off the truck. That's it, they leave everything else on the truck. But long story short, it saved them money, got rid of their entire night crew streamlined it and created new products and services for them all by implementing the technology of the electronic signature so I'm waiting for department stores to do the well correctly do the <coughs> the cards or you don't have to swipe anymore but that's kinda dangerous there's a company that's got this new tag system for products not on the market yet yeah stick all your stuff in the grocery box you know in the, in the grocery cart you just scan the cart underneath, and it tells you how much you owe. <laughs> so it goes through, and it's and then it's great because then you can walk out of the store, and if you didn't pay for something, you catch you. Because like a lot of the self serve, there's people that steal stuff. Yeah, who knew? People steal stuff from the self serve. <laughs> you done with the self checkouts yet? Yeah. Well, there's cameras that watch you, so don't steal anything. But there's people that accidentally don't ring it up right. Or there's the wrong price on it, or something happens with it, right? So they lose a lot of money that way. But if they had a thing you just walked under that just added up everything that's on your body, or everything that's in your possession, wouldn't that be a little bit safer? So we're waiting for futuristic. They have one in Las Vegas. They have a test site for that. But it hasn't been brought out to California yet, so we'll see what happens. But that's much better technology. It's kind of like getting rid of the waiter. In, in actually the same place, Las Vegas, which happens to be the test site for a lot of these things. They have the smart tables. I'm sure you've seen them. Though. They've been on TV for a while. Yeah. yeah. High-end restaurants around here are actually getting them now. You just It's like a touch screen. You just touch things and stuff arrives to your table. And then you put your credit card out there and it, you know, you, you move it like this and it picks it up and then you pay for it. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about the waitress. You just want something, no water napkins, another fork. <laughs> just express what you want as stuff comes over to you. It's like the waiterless table. So it's a nice idea though. Because then you don't have to hire the waiters for it. But is it really providing the same level of customer service? Well, I don't know. Who knows? Probably better because then you don't have to deal with attitudes or anything. So but that's a innovative technology that's helped a business is another example. So like the package carriers, like the 
<clears throat> like the grocery store checkout stuff. Um, and, you know, it's also a form of security. You know, do we have product on you that you haven't paid for? You know, stuff like that. So I is for competitive advantage. So both uh, the FedEx, FedEx and the London Heathrow were uh, developing strategic information systems. The only strategic information systems is going to help sustain competitive advantages. So a lot of the technology and the innovations that you're using are going to be for something. They're either going to be for, you know, saving the company money. Because one of the ones you're going to do as an engineering manager is you have to be responsible for the driving factors. So it might be cost-oriented, make a company more efficient. What about making a company faster? So for the grocery store idea, checking out of the grocery store is the worst part. It's the slowest part. You want to service as many customers as possible. So you want to get them in the door, out the door as fast as possible. Kind of like a restaurant, actually. <coughs> so, um, and you want to collect all your money from all those people. <laughs> so is it efficiency? Is it saving the money, company money? Is it for a competitive advantage? There's so many different factors associated with it, which is why people implement technology and use different systems and different ways of doing things. So, Why information systems matters? IT doesn't matter. Hmm. Well, these are some old articles. They're probably still around. If you're interested, so. Oh, what do I got here? Um, this I never really cover. It's from Apple Computer. If you get the old book, you know, there's a case study in there on Apple. The rest of the slides that actually goes through this case study, it's associated with uh, Apple computers. So, bionic contact lenses. So, bionic eye implants. I think uh, we're building some technology at this comp at the ITU actually. From what I hear, I haven't heard very much about it, but uh, some biomedical. We have a biomedical lab here too. So. It's interesting though. There's a lot of factors that go into the success or failure of technology these days. A lot of it has nothing to do with the technology. It's the management of it <laughs> that causes it to fail. So, what is this here? Opening case here, the managing of the digital world. Mm -hmm. Change the way everybody uses computers, long-lasting successful products, tight integration of items. Well, that's the other interesting thing. In fact, one of the historical parts about Apple in general and why they came out with this, they were going broke. And uh, they had this thing and they, they had this, you know, idea. They put together the first iPod and then they go, well, how do you get stuff on it? So then they put together iTunes, right? And then originally it was only available on the Mac because it was a it was a Mac program. Anyway, so if you look at Apple today, they're no longer a computer manufacturer or a hardware manufacturer. They're a content provider. <laughs> they make more money on iTunes than they do anything else. And if it weren't for this product that they put out that they didn't know what to do with, they didn't know how to, people were going to get stuff on it, they never would have developed iTunes or the App Store, which is kind of interesting because that's their bread and butter right now. That's how they're making, that's how they're making all their money. So. But it was kind of an accident that they put this thing out. Who knew that they were a content provider? <laughs> they didn't even know that. Uh, survival may, may be dependent on employees who failed over and over and then tried new ideas. So. Mac TV, I don't even remember Mac TV. I remember Apple TV. So. They had, they've had, for a company that's been so successful, they've had some of the worst product failures <laughs> as a company, which is kind of interesting. But nobody, nobody looks at their product failures. They always look at the successes. I'm not sure what this bionic contact lenses case is about. So we got the, the two Steves, Jobs and Woz, Wozniak. Uh, they knew each other in high school, you know, started Apple computers. So. And those are some old screenshots. So, Worldwide internet usage, don't need to tell you, from 2008, 17% of the active internet users were located in the United States. Hmm. I don't know. I want to say that that number is probably about the same compared to worldwide. Because if you think about it, the U.S. had it, but a lot of companies didn't have the infrastructure. But now they have faster speed because they didn't, weren't stuck with legacy technology. They just started with the fresh, the latest and the greatest. So there's a lot of uh, internet usage outside of the U.S., probably more so than in the U.S. So. Highest North America, 74% of the population. Lowest Africa, yeah, probably still about the case. 
these numbers are from about ten, two, two years ago, three years ago. So, huh? Africa. Online rights not always universal. That's the other interesting thing too. Is a legal world hasn't caught up with the electronic world yet. So a lot of engineering management topics are definitely legal bound, intellectual property bound, um, trade violation bound, technology violations human rights violations. There's technology to do almost anything these days, but is it ethical? Or is the government going to say that it's ethical? So the more bleeding edge you get with the technology, the more risks are associated with it. So, Which is actually why a lot of um, technology professionals have gone into the law industry, um, which I'm actually a part-time law student myself. <laughs> Um, because I see the potential <laughs> further down the road. Actually, the potential is right now. There's a lot of intellectual property issues going on right now because of the electronic age, because of the Internet, because of technology that's being misused or stolen. So governments in some countries regulate access to information on the web. So China is an example. Porters are without boundaries, uh, call for behavior unethical. Hmm. The role of companies such as Microsoft in dealing with these governments who owns web posted data? Actually, that's a good question. Who owns all your data in Google? Who owns your emails? Because you know everyone's on Google. Everyone's got Gmail, right? I mean, who doesn't have Gmail? Seriously, even ITU, all that stuff is Gmail. So if I send a message out, who owns the Gmail? Google. So they technically own everything, all, all of our work product, everything that we're doing over email. You upload a doc to Google Docs, who owns that? Google. <laughs> I put a video out on YouTube, who owns that? Google. <laughs> what are they doing with it? They're data mining it. They're using it. They're researching it. It's theirs. There's a price. So don't ever think anything's free. There's a price. Is You know it might be free right now. <laughs> You'll be paying for it later. <laughs> Well, Facebook's a different story, though. I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to get into that controversy, but uh, it's a slowly the privacy rights have been violated. Will continue to be violated to a point where it's just, you know, don't put it out on the internet unless you want it broadcasted to everybody. That should the internet create its own laws? I don't think it's possible. <laughs> And the government can't create its own laws either. Guerrilla Wi-Fi. You know, for the longest time they've been saying, you know, cities were going to provide Wi-Fi service, metropolitan internet service. It didn't fly. They tried to do it in Cupertino, I think, actually. It was too expensive. <laughs> they didn't want to provide it. So the digital divide between the haves and the haves not in the IT world. I think everybody has internet access at this point, though. I'm sure that there's some third world areas or something of, in fact, there's parts in the Midwest when people still don't have telephone service in this country. So I doubt that they have internet service either, which is one of the holdbacks actually with um, a lot of the cloud services for software as a service. Microsoft can't put the 360 office out there 100% through a cloud because they can't guarantee that you're always going to have internet service. Which is kind of a bummer, actually. So uh, maybe in the next 10 years, we'll get more reliable, faster. One laptop trip per child attempt. <laughs> they actually did this in the States. They tried to give everybody a laptop. So Now they have to because they're not giving the kids any more books. They're getting PDF files now. <laughs> if you don't have a laptop, you can't read a book for a class if you're going to high school in this country. So, Which is kind of sad if you think about it. Um, affordable Wi-Fi. Yeah. Fifty million dollar minis, Wi-Fi routers. Hmm. All right, last slide here. The business outlook: globalization trend is increasing. Yeah, for the need of global skills, what can you do? Well, gain international experience, learn more than one language, sensitize yourself to global cultures and uh, politics. In addition, immerse yourself into the culture and learn about the local food, stuff like that. Television. Stuff. Believe it or not, it's a human. It's still a human business. So even though we have a lot of technology. Managing engineers and managing engineering projects is still very humanized these days. So, so as promised, it is 3.30, 6. Well, I went six minutes over. <laughs> I don't want to ruin the karma for this class. So as promised, we have to get out early today because I cannot, I cannot hold the class for, well, normally the class will run from 2 to 4. 
maybe 3.30, 3.45-ish. Don't normally hold it because I can't talk for more than a couple hours, hour and a half or so. Plus, you guys get bored after a while. So. Uh, but this is a bell, maybe a little shorter than normal, but it's probably about the same time we'll be getting out. But we have to get out early today because it's first day of class and it's a bad sign. If I keep you the full time, the class will not go well. So in order to preserve quality of the course, we're going to nail it early today. <laughs> If you do have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'm going to hang around a little bit longer. You can ask me. Otherwise, now is your job to make sure you get on the attendance list. Because if you don't make sure, she's not going to probably catch you. I don't know. You're going to do the attendance now? Okay, good. All right, thanks. See you next week.